Hey everyone, we are taking a tour of Chateau d'Azay le Rideau and it is a beautiful structure as you can see behind me if I can take some of this architecture. So it's a chateau that was built in the 16th century. It has some Flemish, Italian and French influences in the architecture as well. In the uh, 19th century, uh, three generations of Marquis de Biancourt dedicated the restoration of this chateau so that it can elevate this whole structure to national treasure levels. It really is a dream turned into a reality and so I hope you enjoy the tour with us. Upon arriving in the Loire Valley, we didn't waste any time in visiting the first chateau on our list. We first had to get settled at our lodgings at Le Châtelet in Toulouse, and the next day we were off. We were still a bit jet-lagged, but there were too many chateaus to see and we had limited time on this trip. It was a beautiful sunny day, a perfect day to visit Château des Rideau. The drive was pleasant and scenic, although we did get a bit lost finding our way to the parking spot. We weren't exactly sure if our car was even allowed to be in some of the small pockets we went into, and hopefully we didn't break any rules. Nonetheless, we found our way to the chateau parking and walked our way to the gates of the chateau through a pathway lined with beautiful trees. Chateau d'Azay le Rideau was the first famous chateau that we visited, and it is everything you'd expect of a castle. It has gorgeous architecture, dreamy gardens, opulent rooms, and a colorful history. It is absolutely stunning. Uh, the architecture, the history that's been associated with this incredible chateau. It is on one of the top 10 most viewed, most visited mm -hmm. lists. And uh, we're here today uh, getting some footage and some content uh, for our Saving Castles community. Built between 1518 and 1527, the chateau showcases a harmonious blend of Italian Renaissance style and French medieval tradition the castle features iconic elements such as high-pitched roofs, intricate stone carvings, and large mullioned windows, which were designed to let in as much natural light as possible, quite a luxury at the time. The chateau was commissioned by Gilles Berthelot, the treasurer of France, and his wife, Philippa Lesbaille. However, their ownership was short-lived. After Berthelot was accused of embezzlement, the chateau was seized by King Francis I and the property changed hands multiple times. It wasn't until the 19th century under the care of the Biancourt family that the chateau was restored to its former glory. Our first stop inside is the antechamber, a room that served as a waiting area for visitors seeking an audience with the lord of the castle. This room is notable for its intricate wood paneling and carved ceiling beams. In the 16th century, bedrooms were in fact used for much more than sleeping, it was also a room where guests would be received. Mixed-use bedrooms generally had an antechamber where guests waited before entering the bedroom. The antechamber also features a remarkable fireplace and displays a number of portraits of kings from the Renaissance to the 18th century. Next, we enter the dining room. While it looks relatively humble for a chateau so grand, this dining room once hosted lavish feasts and gatherings. The elaborate paintings that cover the walls depict scenes of hunting and chivalry, popular themes that symbolized both power and leisure in Renaissance France. As we walk through this room, we couldn't help but imagine the sumptuous banquets, the animated conversations, and the political maneuvering that must have taken place around this very table. Welcome to the Biancourt Salon, named after the Biancourt family, who owned and restored the chateau in the 19th century the Salon has partially preserved its neo-Renaissance interior décor, designed around an imposing fireplace, decorated with wainscoting, covered with leather wallpaper. The fireplace features the famous salamander, an emblem of King Francois I. The furniture you see here comes from the descriptive inventory of the Chateau furniture in 1898. Several photographs and sales documents also testify to the layout of the chateau at that time, which are particularly well documented and have been faithfully restored. This room was a center of social life, 
where the Biancourts would entertain their guests amidst exquisite furnishings and artwork. The family of Biancourt had an extraordinary collection of historical portraits, rich of more than 300 works dating from the Renaissance, the 17th and the 18th century. They are presented on either side of the fireplace, revealing to us the notable figures that once visited and stayed at the chateau. Among them are portraits of Diane de Poitiers, Charles de Lobespine, and Charles III, Duke of Lorraine. And now, we enter the Great Hall, also known as the Salle des Gardes. This room is one of the most impressive in the chateau, dominated by a massive fireplace, once again bearing the emblem of King Francois I, the Salamander. For King Francois, the Salamander is a symbol of bravery and the power to overcome adversity. And we see this as a recurring motif throughout the chateau. The Great Hall served multiple purposes. It was a place for the guards, a dining area, and a space for gatherings and events. The high, beamed ceilings and large windows provide a sense of openness and grandeur, making it easy to imagine the lively banquets and important discussions that must have taken place here. Next, we step into the king's bedroom, a room fit for royalty. This room was prepared for King Louis XIII, who only stayed here a few nights in 1619. The four-poster bed, with its heavy velvet drapes, is a masterpiece of Renaissance craftsmanship. Now, let's step into the kitchen, one of the most atmospheric rooms in the chateau. With its large hearth, hanging copper pots and rustic wooden furniture, the kitchen offers a glimpse into the daily life of the chateau's staff. This was the bustling heart of the household, where meals were prepared over open fires and bread was baked in the large stone oven. The kitchen is still furnished with authentic 16th century cooking tools, and as you walk through, you can almost hear the clatter of pots and pans, the sizzle of food cooking, and the chatter of servants going about their daily tasks. It's a space that truly brings the history of the chateau to life. Our next stop is the billiard room, or Salon de Billard, a later addition that reflects the leisure pursuits of the chateau's more recent inhabitants. The centerpiece of this room is, of course, the beautifully preserved billiard table. Surrounded by comfortable armchairs and a collection of vintage cues, the room exudes a sense of relaxed sophistication. It's easy to imagine the Biancourt family and their guests gathering here in the evenings, enjoying a game of billiards while engaging in lively conversation. Before we step outside, we can't forget the gorgeous grand staircase. Unlike the spiral staircases common in medieval castles, this staircase is a wide, straight ramp, a design that was revolutionary at the time. It's adorned with intricate carvings of floral motifs and mythical creatures, reflecting the Renaissance passion for blending art and architecture. The staircase winds its way elegantly through the heart of the chateau, and its open, airy design allows light to pour in through the large, mullioned windows. Now I want to take this moment to appreciate the fact that when we visited the chateau, it was almost as if we had it to ourselves. There weren't a lot of visitors, which is a surprise because the chateau is one of the most frequently visited. And this reminded us that it really matters to know the best times and the best tours to book when visiting chateaus in France, which is why we created our ultimate online castle guides. These guides, easily downloadable on your phone through the Thatch app, offers you a curated list of castles in the Loire Valley, Northern France, and Southern France, as well as our recommended tours, lodgings, and restaurants. There are over 40,000 castles in France alone, with the Saving Castle's Ultimate Castle Guides, you can shortcut the overwhelming planning process and go on a stress-free and magical tour of France's most majestic castles. Finally, we step outside to the gardens, a serene complement to the grandeur of the chateau. These gardens were redesigned in the English style in the 19th century, with winding paths, picturesque lawns, and a variety of rare trees and flowering plants. The reflection of the chateau in the calm waters of the Andra River creates a perfect mirror image, adding to the enchanting beauty of this place. It was here, among the roses and the soft rustle of leaves, that we took a moment to reflect on the history and the stories that the chateau has to tell. We hope you've enjoyed this tour as much as we did. If you ever find yourself in the Loire Valley, make sure to visit this gem of the Renaissance. Until next time!
We're going to eat. Yes, finally. <laughs>